Please welcome Dr. Janice Presser, CEO, The Gabriel Institute. I was neither born nor raised to be a leader, not the architect of a new technology, not the founder of a startup company, not a CEO. I was expected to be like my mother and the other women who started their families in 1946, the first full year of peace after World War II. I was meant to be a lady with a wardrobe of gloves and hats and aprons. And my career aspirations, if any, were to be a teacher so I could have summers off with my children. But as the 50s turned into the 60s, neither the place or the peace or the place of women would remain, hardly anything for that matter, would ever remain the same. Unfortunately, corporate America was slow to catch up. So with my college degree in hand, I applied for my first professional position and was given a typing test. This was before the invention of the pantsuit. <laughs> Time went on, as did my life. And suffice it to say, many things happened. Some were planned, some were unexpected, some were miracles. So with your permission, I'd like to share brief stories from three phases of my life and what they taught me about leadership, teamwork, and team ability. Now, as a young adult, I had the most profound education in leadership. My teacher was Andrew, my firstborn, and he taught me things that I could not have learned from books or coaches. And I didn't have to wait very long for my learning to begin. It began at his conception. See, while marriage is an intimate partnership, it doesn't prepare you for an entirely new kind of relationship that you develop with a human being who's growing inside of you. There's the figuring out what of you is you and what of you is this other person, and the realization that sometimes you're in sync and there are other times when you're not. Now, then, before you know it, you're clearly two separate people, and you have to begin again bridging all your differences. For instance, Andrew was born speaking a completely different language. It consisted of about a dozen versions of crying. Now, I had a huge vocabulary of words, but I didn't understand crying at all. I dearly wanted to teach him my language, but I soon realized that before he would ever understand me, I would have to find a way to understand him. It was like learning to dance, and you know, he gave me lesson number one. If you want to lead, first you must learn to follow. Another thing that Andrew taught me, just by being there, is that a third person has a profound impact on the relationship between two other people. Now, for those of you who are parents, I don't have to explain it. For those of you who aren't, I don't know that I ever could. Just take my word for it. When people are in each other's presence, lots of things are going on between them, even when there's no eye contact and no words are being spoken. You know, if you're trying to lead, it helps to be really clueful about what's going on at every level. So, having received my leadership certification from Andrew, I felt ready to be one in the big world. And I did it by running and later by starting several volunteer organizations. You know, I had not been raised to be a CEO, so I didn't realize you could actually get paid for doing this. But I did learn a lot of things about business and management, including the one skill that really enabled me to make it as an entrepreneur. I got really good at getting people to do stuff for nothing. Now, during the years when this volunteer business was going on, I was observing a lot of team activity in all kinds of situations. And what I saw was sometimes truly puzzling. I mean, why, I wondered, did the presence or absence of one specific person seem to have such an outside impact on the team? Why did some people handle team upsets so calmly, while others went completely off the rails? 
And what was behind the nitpicking and the backbiting on a team when everyone had said that their reason for being there was to be part of a team that helped and supported people? I began to think that there was a lot more teamwork than just people and job titles. See, people bring their intellect, their personalities, their knowledge, and their experience to teams, and those things are important. I knew there were ways to measure and evaluate, evaluate those attributes, but I wanted to know, was there a way to understand and measure the quality of connection or collaboration that a person or a team was capable of generating? So without having planned for it or having been born or raised for it, I was on my way to becoming a behavioral scientist specializing in teams. Now to get where I wanted to go, I had to understand teams that worked well and those that didn't. And so I thought a lot about math and chemistry and physics. You know, in the physical sciences, when things don't work together, scientifically speaking, nothing happens, right? You know, but when chemical reactions do happen, it's because one part connects with or needs the other, and they need each other in the right proportions. Perhaps people and people in teams were no different. What if principles like valence and coherence and molarity were actually happening? What if there was a way to understand and work with the physics of teaming? And then I fell in love again. Not in the usual sense of love, not as I had been raised to think of love as the opening chapter of first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Janice with a baby carriage. Instead, I began to fall in love with my team, the people who connected with the big vision of understanding what really happens when people team together and the potential of this new understanding to change the world. It started with my long-term research partner, Dr. Jack Gerber, in the mid-80s. Jack's a brilliant researcher, but he and I were traveling in uncharted territory, trying to measure what happens in the spaces between people instead of measuring what's inside them. We began to look at the team as a separate living thing, all by itself, with needs of its own, and with people inside it who, for their own good, and for the good of the organization, filled those needs. In building out the theoretical structure, we confirmed that, indeed, different people desire to serve different organizational needs. Getting at this kind of information was a very complex process, and even a very fast, very expensive computer took hours to process what we were measuring. But the juice was worth the squeeze. We found that when you feel like you have your mission in life, that that's a scientifically valid feeling. And we took that knowledge to be a foundational element of team behavior. We called it ROLE, with a capital R. And we eventually identified 10 elemental roles that working in concert could meet all of an organization's needs. And we knew, with all of our love of science, that identifying and understanding a person's role could be invaluable to management in selecting team members and assigning job responsibilities, and also to individuals in choosing a field of study, a career, even a life partner. Along the way, we learned that some people are more comfortable with others in coping with the normal stresses of teamwork, and that they differ widely in this capacity. Following this physics of a team model, we acknowledged this attribute as coherence, having proved to our satisfaction that it had physical properties, just like coherent light or sound. People with higher coherence just send clearer signals, and they resist disruption. Teams with a high level of coherence at their core tend to stay on an even keel, even under the pressure of tight deadlines, mission-critical situations, and demands for high quality of level, high quality levels, adaptability, productivity. We also found it was possible to measure and predict the elements of teaming that behave very differently under different environmental or contextual conditions. And we call these qualities teaming characteristics. When it's about culture, you know, whether the question is how to sustain it, how to replicate it, 
or how to completely change it, the answers are often embedded in the teaming characteristics of the team members. Now, today, it all comes together. Leadership, teamwork, and team ability. Because every one of you already is a leader in at least one aspect of your life. You lead yourself on your personal mission, and you drive yourself on to connect with those who are meant to be your traveling companions. And now, you can learn to do it all better and to love what you do and who you do it with. With this new understanding, you can design an ideal collaborative structure for your teams, making your workplace a better place to work. Technology has enabled us to bridge great distances. The technology of teaming enables us to close the gaps between people. And what makes them happy, comfortable, and productive doing what they do. To discover and nurture the, the love of achievement, of innovation, and everything you bring to the world, this is what makes people feel truly successful, deeply successful. Education, experience, and skills will always be important, but adding a person's team ability into the mix levels the playing field. It opens the doors of opportunity for everyone. You don't even need the technology of team or the, the team analysis uh, pilot to begin the transformation of your team or yourself. Just start with these three simple questions. Are you doing enough of what you like? Are you doing too much of what you don't like? And what can we do together to change things and make them better? We believe that the organizational operating system of the future will emerge through team analysis and the practical application of teaming analytics. Its methods will be intrinsic to the true social nature of team interaction. We have big spaces to fill and important work to do. And so with your permission, I'd like to bless our work together Team well and prosper. <laughs>